Hi, I'm Chris Delion of HobbyGameDev.com. What I want to talk about today is the relationship between payment models and game design tastes. So, there are many different tastes that people have in game design. For some people, challenge is very important. For others, the social experience is. For others still, story is center place, and for others, replayability seems very important, while to others, having to replay any piece of content seems frustrating and unfair. And it'd be one thing, we could just leave it as it is and say that different people have different tastes in games. In the same way that some people like country music and some people like rock or hip-hop, there's nothing wrong with having different tastes, but what I emphasize today is the way that different economic models that have funded the development of games have led to different sort of ecological niches, if you will, within which certain tastes have been preferred or rewarded for developers who meet those tastes. And so why this matters? There's just a contemporary discussion. Asher and Greg, both by this measure, clearly more successful game designers than I, so this isn't meant to be a critique of them. It's just thinking about the way we talk about and discuss game design. They recently were very successful in releasing a game called Threes, and a clone of their game, 2048, a bit of derivative title of it, in some measures seems to be doing better than Threes in terms of its response in the marketplace. And one of the comparisons that they drew in discussing the differences between their games and the clone is that their game is closer to the classic chess rule of a game you could play forever. A game that's, as I said in my certain little intro discussion dialogue boxes, easy to learn and hard to master. But what I'm going to suggest is that in some ways this is almost as inappropriate as assuming that the kind of CDs that will wind up on the best sellers for the pop list in your local music store somehow meet the same criteria and ideals and metrics that evolved around a whole different economic system of classical music which had different time periods, different durations, different settings that we'd expect it as people enjoying music. In the same way, chess serves a different set of ideals, I'm going to argue, than say a mobile game or web game or other types of modern games that aren't classic board games. Where the story begins for me though is growing up my brother and I played Bubble Bobble and Marble Madness on the Nintendo Entertainment System. We both really liked that we could play this game, either one of these games, at the same time. Two players simultaneous, whether co-op or, com or competitive. Now what I didn't understand at the time, because I was just a child, was that the reason why these games had two players simultaneous was because they were ports of arcade games. That in the early to mid 80s, the arcades were hitting a really hard time. The industry was coming out of the great crash of 1983 when it shrunk from a $3 billion a year industry to a $100,000 a year industry. And so they had to find ways to multiply the number of coins coming in. And they've realized that if we put as an internal constraint for design documents, that a game should be designed to support multiple players at the same time, then they could help make these machines a, a smarter buy for a location owner of an arcade. And so in this way, the reason why my brother and I were able to enjoy those two player same time games, they got designed to meet the business criteria of an early arcade struggle. Now, speaking of arcade struggle, it's fairly well known that early arcade games were excruciatingly difficult. So here we see Defender and Donkey Kong, Tempest, Robotron, and Galaga. Games from different developers, different companies, different parts of the world. And in all cases, they were extremely difficult because, of course, an arcade machine only gets paid once per each time you play it. And only one person at a time can play, so you need to boot that person off the machine so the next person can try. It's also a very steep difficulty ramp in which you're immediately thrown into the deep end. There's not really much of a soft tutorial or a walkthrough short of the, the attract loop. And instead, even if you're a practiced player and you start again, you don't go back through a really easy level one, you're immediately back into the action trying to do all the same things you have to do for the whole game. It's a different experience than what we'd expect if we walked into a newer type of game venue. But if we walk into an old context, like an old video arcade, you know, like the one we see here, where it's mostly still displays and joysticks and trackballs, not the kind of thing with the race cars. And we'll talk about how arcades have changed since. But if you walk into this kind of setting, you're expecting a certain play experience. You're expecting games that are going to be very difficult. Games that are relatively short play sessions. You're not expecting much of a story. You're probably not expecting much exploration. It's a very particular experience you're going to get out of this kind of setting. Now, by contrast, if we walk into a software, etc., Babbage's, Electronics Boutique, any one of the stores that have since been conglomerated into GameStop, and I use these older ones because we could do this at the same time in history. We could have walked into an arcade, and then next door in the same shopping mall, gone to software, etc., we would expect very different games. Here we'd expect more exploration, longer total play time. It wouldn't be as much about quick, pitch and, quick twitch and reaction timing in most cases. It might still have a factor of it, but it's not the sole emphasis in the way it was for something like Defender or Gravatar or Asteroids. 
And so it's just an easy categorization. And this, of course, is a draw. There's lines we can draw between any two economic platforms. I find Coin Op Arcade and Home Console, because they've both around for so many decades, one of the easier ones to distinguish. In the arcade, we expect short play sessions. We expect high replay value. You know, replay value and replayability used to be one of those metrics that game, game magazines would idealize and discuss. How replayable is this game? How high is the replay value? Well, you want to play it again and again and again. That has since faded as we moved away from arcade ports. We expect the game to be very difficult, and we expect there to be not a whole lot of total content. That within the first several minutes of playing, we could have seen every piece of art in the game. Very different from in the home console games, and so here we see on the right uh, Atari Adventure by Warren Robin, one of the early games to explore the idea that a home console game isn't really the same kind of game necessarily as the arcade experience. Here Atari Adventure wouldn't really work too well in the arcades, it's a longer form of play. Not even especially huge, but still it's, a, it's based around exploration and learning the maze, finding a route. And once you do that, you've kind of extinguished it. You've kind of, you're done with it in the same, same way you can read a book and put it on the shelf. These games often for a home console would rely more on story or exploration, things which you can be done with, unlike the core interactions that happen on an arcade cabinet where you don't really get done with Tetris or with Joust, the game shown here. Likewise, these are games to be won by persistence, or at Jesper Yule terms, games of labor, meaning that with enough persistence, anybody can kind of get through it. It's not super critical that you can pull off some insane stunt. In many cases, you just got to keep throwing yourself at it until you finish it. And then again, a long total play time. We'll discuss a reason for this in a minute. But these two games, I want to stress, I didn't just cherry pick these two, could just easily be Tetris and Zelda. And of course, Tetris, I will admit, held, held, holds up quite well on handheld games as well for reasons we'll discuss in a little bit. Sometimes these things port, sometimes they don't. Asteroids, or Super Mario Bros. 3. Space Invaders, or a game like Dragon Warrior. Ghosts and Goblins, or, Ghost, uh, or Ghouls and Ghosts, the various games in that series, as compared to a game like Pitfall, a longer home play experience. Now, the reason why I chose Ghosts and Goblins is because it's both a very hard arcade game and also an extremely hard home console game, too. And this speaks to a very particular weird time in history where the first console games that we played were, in many cases, ports of arcade games. People finally had the hardware to make a longer play experience. They were no longer constrained by, we can only afford, you know, so many little images on screen at a time. We can only afford so many worlds at once. They can make longer games, but because they were still honed for the arcade play experience, they were expected to defeat you within 30 seconds, within a few minutes, very promptly, to make you either replay or put in more points to continue, or have someone else step in and take your spot in line. And so that's why for many of these early, early games that were first in the arcade, Contra here, and Double Dragon, in their home console ports to Nintendo Entertainment System, they're extremely hard, and for the most part, you weren't meant to see the ending unless you used something like Konami Code to cheat your way to make a lot of progress, or of course some of us would use Game Genies. And so one of the first times when I saw this inflection point in my life between economic models was I remember mid-late 90s. It was around the same time I was kind of finding my way out of being such a game player in terms of where I spent my time, and more and more people seemed to be complaining about the idea that replay was punishment. That if you had to do something again in a game, you were being punished somehow. And this didn't make sense to me. Because the kind of games I liked playing, like Pac-Man and Rampage, Pinball, it didn't matter that I was replaying it, that was what I was there to do. I was there to play that game. And if they made me do it again, great, I'm having fun doing it. It didn't make sense why people would complain about that to me. But of course for games that are longer, that involve a lot of story, or that involve a lot of exploration, checkpoints became imperative. So here we see Pitfall 2, one of the early games on Atari that had checkpoints. And it's because here it was less about the core interactions of battling in sort of an arena space, as we did see for those arcade or pinball machines, and more about continuous progress through more and more content, through exploring new territories and finding new kinds of enemies. And in that case, making someone sit through the same story again or rediscover things they've already discovered, clearly can grind on people or grade on people in a way that it doesn't if I'm just jumping into another round of joust in the arcade. This, of course, is also where we're going to start seeing password features, as shown here for Kid Icarus, Mega Man, or Castlevania, respectively. And this also maps in some ways onto smartphone and current-gen console games still. So one of the things I discussed near the end of my pinball thesis talk, which is another YouTube video I can link you to, is one where I discuss the ways that casual games in the modern sphere have in many ways learned lessons from the arcade-style games that were designed several decades prior. But it's a bit of a tangent here, and we're going to go back to the point we're sticking to of the historical point first. One of the curious things that arises from this realization, this discussion, is that Nintendo Hard, or what we often call Nintendo Hard, really wasn't the Nintendo Entertainment System. Games that were natively designed for Nintendo, say Zelda, Final Fantasy, or Metroid, 
are in many cases games you can beat through persistence. It's not super important that you have an incredible level of skill, and again, these aren't unskilled games either, but they are not nearly the same abusive experience as we'd expect from the arcades. Nintendo Hard, in many cases, actually referred to arcade games, Donkey Kong, Punch-Out, or NES ports of arcade games like Qbert, where they were built initially for a context meant to take your quarters away, and then they found their way into the home console system, like Contra and like Double Dragon, where suddenly you're left wondering why is it so hard, and it's so hard because it was there to take your quarters. Now, one of the reasons why those console games had a good reason to be longer was because of the rental system. There was a way that instead of spending $60 on a game, you would walk into a store, give them a few bucks, have the game for the weekend. And if you could get the, the full experience and explore all the game's content that way, why would you ever spend $60 on anything? Suddenly it made sense to give you a longer arc in which you couldn't just walk into a store and borrow it for a few days, you needed to buy it to get the full experience and see everything the game had to offer. This is also a space that simultaneously PCs were exploring with the shareware model in a slightly different way. Here the question wasn't, how do I make a game that's long enough that you can't just rent it? Instead it was, what kind of game can we design where we can give you a section of it, whether Wolfenstein, Doom, Quake, and of course many other games use shareware model as well, those are just some of the higher profile ones. How can we design a game where we can give you a fifth of it, a sixth of it, a seventh of it, and that won't be enough to leave you uninterested in playing the rest? Because you know what, if you, showed, if you try to create a shareware version of Pac-Man, there's not really anything else to share, there's only a single maze, you're not going to bother to upgrade. And even though Miss Pac-Man has several different mazes in it, if you gave me a shareware version of Miss Pac-Man, I might be perfectly satisfied with that single maze. And so it became important to figure out, okay, how can we distinguish these different regions with new kinds of bosses, new kinds of guns, new kinds of content to justify the upgrade for someone to convert from a shareware player who's playing it for free to then someone who's paying money for the licensed version. And this demo challenge has stayed with us now for decades. And so when I was on the Medal of Honor Airborne team, briefly, Electronic Arts, we had the challenge there of deciding for the Xbox Live demo and for the File Planet demo, how big of a chunk of the game do we give people? And do we limit it by time? Do you give them a whole mission out of the six from the game? What's going to give them a succinct feeling for the game, but not give them so much of the experience that they're left uninterested in having any more? These are not challenges that arcade games ever had to deal with or design around. And you're, of course, probably also noticing that in many cases, these games come from different eras. I've tried to draw on a few for more recent to make a case for how it's still relevant to today, but of course, around the same time of Atari, many games looked like this game, Combat, which was an adaptation of an arcade game as well. And this is something that uh, technological factors played a role in, why these systems couldn't show more stuff. So even though this is the same system that also had Pitfall 2, the longer game with checkpoints, and Adventure, Warren Robinett's game that helped demonstrate how console games could be different from arcade games, there were many constraints and limitations for technological reasons at the time, that helped guide the decisions for the types of games, the only kind of games that they could make. Why I want to make a point though that this isn't just a historical conversation about technical constraints, is that newer tools and development environments like Unity have in many ways lifted or at least greatly alleviated the challenges of taking a game that could work on a mobile platform and also make it work in a browser or as a downloadable experience. Now someone might think, why not just make every game playable in browser, because it's so much easier for people to get to, but there's still particular experiences and nuances and conventions that have been defined around downloading a game as opposed to playing it in a web browser. And so I think it's helpful for us to think about these historical cases and these other business models when we make choices about newer games we're developing with Unity, about why it would make sense to make a game downloadable as opposed to web player, as opposed to mobile, as opposed to, heck, getting a license to put it on a console, even though in the case of Unity it's almost as simple as just clicking on a different option in the export screen. So, Historically, it's pretty obvious and we can easily discuss, and journalists often do, the games that get made have to reflect what people want. And as creators, we often discuss the fact that games also have to reflect what developers want to make. Someone's got to want to make it, someone's got to want to play it. Platform studies helps discuss what can current technology do, because it has to be something current technology can do for developers to do it. And what I want to bring into this discussion is this lower bubble of what can earn enough money to fund it, to fund its development and distribution and the related marketing challenges and so on as another part of that equation of what gets made and more importantly what sustains, what sticks after it gets made instead of being a one-off anomaly of a game that maybe didn't recoup its cost and thus no one else tried to go down that path after that developer. And of course we can ask the same kind of questions because it was such a quick bubble of 99 cent mobile paid games. For a very brief time in history we have this recent case where games only cost a dollar 
free to play hadn't taken off yet. Highest grossing didn't exist as a category because games that sold were, in many cases, very cheap, and they didn't have in-app purchases yet as a feature. And there's a particular type of game that fit well in this mold for the difficulty expectations, for the time of play, for the time per session, for the total amount of content that people expected. And it's just another space we can look at where, yes, it's also true that it was on a touch screen, but even independent of that touch screen, I think there's other ways we can piece together about the play experience of who it's reaching in a certain channel based on a certain payment model. And so a useful way to think about this is, okay, what focus from the developer gets rewarded financially? Is it long or short play length, randomization or memorization, quantity of distinct content in the game total, frequency of plays, so in the case of a coin-operated game, frequency of play matters a lot. Span or the of the total time installed or subscribed for a subscription-based game like an MMO, of course that's a metric they want to optimize, in a way that you didn't really care for a $60 retail game if they kept playing it for months and months. In fact, maybe you didn't want them to, you wanted them to finish the game so they'd go buy another one. Number of upsells or conversions. And this, of course, is the shareware or the demo problem of how many people can you get to go from someone who's not paying you to paying you? And it's a similar question that people ask now for DLC or in-app purchases. Is it easy to write or talk about as a particular challenge that, as the market has become oversaturated with many styles of games, some are easier than others to discuss? And so this becomes a metric that people can design around for certain platforms and avenues of funding. And will people buy a sequel? So there are sequels to many arcade games that we like. There's an Asteroids Deluxe. There is a Joust 2. These games aren't great, and no one really cares for them. Interestingly, sequels didn't really ever work that great in arcades, Street Fighter 2 notwithstanding, in a way that at home consoles, they were extremely important. In many cases, you want to go back and buy the prequels to the game that you're currently playing. You want to get the sequels to the one because you want more Mega Man bosses. You want more Castlevania experiences. And so sequels for certain kind of platforms get favored in a way they don't for others. And I think one of the ways we can think about that question is how does the economics play into it? How does the story if it's a factor, playing to it, and so on. So I kind of built this little cycle as just a way of thinking through the process. Because part of what interests me is that even though Mark Cerny was very explicit about the fact that he was designing machines to eat more quarters, and that, that was a directive inside the company he worked at at the time, it doesn't have to always be intentional. It can simply be evolutionary. And I think this is part of what happened with social games and Facebook, with sort of the various payment schemes that have happened in app purchases, with the free-to-play systems, Various things that have evolved very quickly, in many cases, I don't think anyone had the time to sort out how what's going to be the most highest grossing. They used metrics and A-B testing and so on to rapidly iterate and evolve this process and then cloned one of those work to ride that progress. So step one, whenever a new platform comes out or a new way to pay for games, developers' first move is to try to make things that we recognize. Variations of something that we already know. A platformer, a shooting game, a exploration game, adventure, right? RPG, I don't know, we'll try it. Spaghetti at the wall approach. Developers find ways to make variations of what has already proven successful before, and we'll see what's going to make the most revenue, but then some variants will get the most money. Those games that do well wind up in the highest grossing, the top paid, the top of the sales charts. Uh, you know, old game magazines several decades ago even actually included charts for which arcade games were pulling in the most quarters. And let me tell you, I've been a developer now for a while, a little bit of time professionally, and it's not just players looking at those charts. Developers are absolutely paying attention to discussing what's the top five, what's the top ten, what are they doing, are there ways that we can like take that same setting and put it in space, are there ways that we can take the same setting and mix pirates in, what can we do, right, to leverage the fact that we've now identified that there's a market of people who want this and they're paying a lot of money for it in whatever this channel is. And in this case, the people who play those games either begin, or people who want the kind of games that get made in those platforms either become players if they weren't players before or they keep playing if it still fits their interest regardless of the kind of games that they played before. These people are now the target demographic for the next wave of games because when the big guns come in, when the big financial parties, the investors, the publishers move into the space, they want to see, they want to be able to take bets on things that you can prove there's likely some market for and that stable market is defined by who's already bought things on a certain platform and a certain channel. So it doesn't matter why Tim or Betsy or someone else is buying that game, what they want to know is that, okay, on a mobile platform at 99 cents, here's the kind of thing that right now sells if we act on it soon before the market changes from underneath us. That then feeds back into giving the developers more resources, power, and direction towards making more things like whatever already rose to the top of the stack in a particular payment model, as defining, again, preferences for play length, multiplayer's importance, story's importance, replayability. 
another criteria which, independent of a particular economic context, might seem like arbitrary tastes, but within consideration of the economic context, will evolve to be those which rise to the top economically, get cloned by others, varied by others, funded by people with more economic power, and those games then come to define the platform until the platform or the economics change. Now, some ports definitely work. And again, like I mentioned earlier, Tetris did great in the arcades and super phenomenal for the Game Boy handheld. And you can kind of ignore this, hopefully, because this is where my thinking was seven years ago when Wii was very new, when casual web games seemed like a relatively new thing, when casual meant $20 downloadable in some cases from someone like Big Fish. I was trying to ponder through what types of games make sense on different kind of platforms and what are they idealizing, what are they preferencing, are some yays or nays, does some not matter? Because it was a way of thinking through how do you design something that works on a variety of different platforms. And it's just kind of an exercise. Again, the market's changed a lot in seven years since, but it's a way of trying to frame and think through what's the intersection of these games that you can design that'll port well. But most games don't survive the port, and we've seen this especially fall on its face with something like Dungeon Keeper, a game that was super well respected back when it was a full-priced retail game. There's since been an in-app purchases version of it that's free to play in which you're constantly nagged to spend money in it, and people are pretty upset. We see the same thing with MechWarrior 2 Online. So this is the old MechWarrior, a game that was very sort of a rich, deep atmosphere simulator game, sort of going for hyper-realism as much as it could in the mid-90s. And it's a game that when they adapted to MechWarrior Online and started charging people $500 optional for having gold mechs, they felt was destroying what made the game great. What I want to argue, though, is that it's not, in fact, free to play that's the problem here. It's trying to take a game which evolved to thrive in a particular economic context and slap a different economic model onto it. So it's a little bit like I've owned NES ports of arcade games that are very obviously arcade games, Pac-Man, Galaga, and so on, and you pretty quickly tire of them, because when you're no longer paying per play, it loses a lot of its weight and its significance. Those are games that were designed to work well, designed specifically to only work when being paid for, in a way that some games survived that jump, games like Bubble Bobbler, Mar Marvel Madness, and other games simply did not. It's weird how the way we pay for things affects the kind of experience we have playing them. Now, there's also been a bit of an arms race, admittedly, between what we can do with arcade graphics and home consoles and PC games, which increasingly the home consoles and the PCs have been catching up, or exceeding in some cases, what we can see from our arcade hardware. So this, of course, is one of the Far Cry games, played on a home system, beautiful and engaging graphics. But what's interesting is, even though the arcade was capable of these kind of graphics before the home consoles were, we didn't really see that happening. We didn't see the same interface of WASD and mouse, or of running around and controlling the shooting. We saw many on-rails games like Time Crisis, where it steered the camera for you, and you're shooting at things on the screen, Yes, it's true they are light gun games at home, but they were never nearly as significant and central to the experience as you expect to see light guns in the arcade. And it's just sort of a weird novelty that, yeah, I guess they also exist in the home systems. Now, there's been an exception here, of course, in terms of Duck Hunt, a classic Nintendo game that came with the zapper in the system. That actually has to do with another economic discussion that's a bit of a tangent here, in which Nintendo's original hardware was having troubles getting itself positioned in stores like Sears, etc., because Atari seemed like it had recently failed in the video game market. And so with things like Rob the Toy uh, Robot and the Zapper, they were trying to package it as though it's a toy to position it differently in a different market segment than the flopping electronic industry of electronic games of Atari that had recently crashed. So a bit of a tangent, but light gun games at home, aside from Zapper, have not done nearly as much sort of good or visibility as they have in the arcades. Fancy, speaking of those guns, so fancy arcade controls have always been a centerpiece. And this is something that Marble Madness, Mark Cerny talked about in his sort of post-mortem from that game. It was originally meant to have a force feedback trackball, because that seemed neat at the time. That would help set it apart from games like Centipede that just had a simple trackball without it. At the end of the day, they weren't able to deliver on the force feedback due to pinching fingers and complexity of maintenance and damage, you know, complicated machinery. But even a game like Paperboy relied on playing with these little bicycle handles. And still, if you go to an arcade, you'll find that they may have lost the graphics race, or at least been caught up to by the home consoles and the PC games, which you'll tend to find instead are tons and tons and tons of games that have totally different controllers, all very different, all high durability, all very expensive. Racing cars, motorcycles to tilt and lean on, punching bags to hit, DDR pads to jump on that are much more rugged than the little home fold-out mats. This has become the way that the arcade market has found a way to they now are incentivized no longer to kill the player in 30 to three minutes, or 30 seconds to three minutes like they used to, 
The new incentive for an arcade game is to try to beat the console games by doing things in terms of hardware that you can pay a little bit of money to borrow for one or two plays that you're not going to spend the money on to have in your home. Again, DDR pads have kind of found their way around that. Same deal with DDR, uh, Guitar Hero controls. And now this has been an interesting space in, or, or another sort of direction these things have taken, has been in, in paid beta, or games, whether Kickstarter or otherwise, that people pay for before the game's done. They might pay for while it's in development, they might pay for before it's been delivered, and along the way they kind of get a voice in how it's being made. And naturally, there's a certain kind of game that's one more likely to succeed in this space than others. And this is, this is, again, this is all preliminary research, so I don't have great answers for this yet, except to say I think it's a fascinating thing to be exploring. What types of games are people kickstarting? What types of games are people uh, doing for paid beta? Because I'm going to suggest that they're going to have a whole different set of ideals around them than those that have thrived in the arcades and those that have thrived in the home consoles, especially in a contemporary setting and so on. Now, one of the things that I think it's worth addressing from this is the lag time between the time that we as developers, or even as adult critics, have between the time we spent growing up with certain kinds of games, and we grew up and we find a new type of game has arisen as dominant in the market. What we see here is Mayor of New York LaGuardia uh, and the police commissioner destroying pinball machines because they were perceived as stealing money from children, of, of being part of the criminal element, of all kinds of complaints and concerns that is basically a Skinner box tricking people out of their money. Now. I happen to like pinball machines and think that they're not that criminal, and mind you, some of these are payouts, there's a little more complicated history here we're going into. But there was a misunderstandings about the fact that these weren't the kind of games that these people like to play, they weren't the kind of games that they knew from when they were kids, and so it was easy to think that no one's gonna, that these are terrible, these are awful, these are just tricking people. And I'll tell you what, when MMOs were new, and I had grown up playing games that were single player or local multiplayer only, games that I could finish playing, games where skill time, skill was mostly in the form of reaction time, I didn't really get what the MMO experience was all about. I didn't like all the menus, I didn't like all the socializing, I didn't like that it never finished. These all went against everything I liked about games, and so to my mind these were wrong, these were bad games, these are something that people must be just getting addicted to. Because it's so easy to write off anything we don't like as just being a Skinner box. Not understanding that someone else is deriving genuine enjoyment from it, who wasn't necessarily liking the kind of games that we were playing. And at no point were the games being made because they liked them or because I liked them. They were being made because those are the kind of games that, get, that could be funded at the time through the economic models which were at the time supported. And as long as it found enough critical mass of people, it didn't matter which people, willing to pay that money to play it, those games were brought into existence and then cloned and duplicated and so on. I got involved some years ago with a company called Zip Sap Play, which got involved, involved in the, after I left in the social Facebook game scene before Facebook's platform changed and sort of put a damper on certain styles of these games. But this was an exercise in uh, a whole type of game that I had never appreciated. And I know some of my coworkers, they, these weren't the kind of games that they grew up with. And they would feel a need to implement these features based on kind of what other people in the market were doing that were succeeding. Again, just looking at top grossing, top paid, how do you kind of steer your design to learn and leverage from their lessons? Because you know there's a customer base who wants it. And so they would sort of semi-cynically implement these features like, okay, we're gonna have this thing because it's what the market seems to want right now. We're like, you get a pop-up message sometimes that says a dog has walked by your cafe. Do you want to give it to your friend Ashley? And it's like, oh, does anyone really want this? Who wants to spam their friends? This, like, this is kind of dumb. But then sure enough, you know, a uh, company was doing video play testing. I later learned from one of my coworkers there. And in part of the video play test, it's, you get strangers to play the game. You pay them a little fee of money for doing so. And you, they kind of, you observe the notes of them playing it. And there they are clicking and doing stuff and managing their cafe. And then a pop-up comes up that they get a puppy. And she was genuinely excited about this puppy passing the store. And she actually was kind of happy to share it with her friend Ashley or whoever her friend might have been. And this is something that I had never wrapped my mind around that, that it's not the kind of game I like to play. But there's someone out there who genuinely was getting enjoyment from it. And it was being made because at the time that was something that economically publishers and investors and so on could justify putting the money behind the developers who I think they could deliver on and expectations of known audience. We're back in that economic cycle of, this was not something that ever made sense as a retail shelf experience. This is not something that ever made sense as an arcade walk up to the cabinet experience. That doesn't make it wrong any more than what's in the arcade and what's on the home console haven't necessarily lined up for 30 years either, but they both serve different needs for different audiences in different ways and ecosystems largely shaped or reinforced or crystallized by the economic models that people use to fund those games into existence. Now one of the nagging questions 
that I've had to explore and think about a lot while doing this is where in the heck does this leave free games? If economics are such an important factor in shaping the way people discuss and work with and find the kind of games they like, if they walk into the arcade to play arcade-style games, and if they walk into software, etc., to get console-style games, what do we do with free games? What are people expecting? And I think it's actually one of the barriers that we're up against because people of any given background with any given expectation might stumble into our thing. And they might hate it because they weren't guided by some narrowing criteria of knowing what they're going to get ahead of time based on how other mobile games are, based on how other free-to-play games are, and so on. But this is where I think one of the things we've inadvertently discovered as a community of freeware game developers is the ways that we can leverage outdated modes of styles of art, pixel art of various manifestations, as a clue to our players of what kind of non-free tradition we're trying to build our game in the history of. So if a game looks kind of like a Super Nintendo game, you can kind of assume that it's should kind of meet the feel and the length and the difficulty of a Super Nintendo game. If something looks like it belongs in an arcade from the 1980s, you can expect to lose in the first 30 seconds to 3 minutes in many cases, because we use that as a, as a tool to communicate to our players which set of historical or economically defined narrowed conventions they're likely to find themselves on in our game. And of course, if you're making a game that doesn't fit into those historical conventions, it becomes very important to find a whole different aesthetic to help communicate to them, don't treat it like that, don't treat it like an arcade game any more than don't treat it like a PlayStation 2 game. This is a whole new and different thing, and it's thinking about our art as a tool, as an instrument for communicating expectations and conventions to our players. So anyway, that's all I've got to chat about for now. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen. Hopefully it's been informative or interesting. This is by no means finished research. This is simply tip of the iceberg of an area I think is interesting and worth exploring and discussing more. If you have more thoughts about it, by all means let me know. You can hit me at hobbygamedev on Twitter, email me at hobbygamedev at gmail.com, or you can find my site hobbygamedev.com if you need other ways to get in touch with me. Thanks again. again. Thanks once again. Uh, Chris Leon. I'll have more content for you soon. Bye-bye.